Hello. William James said that genius is simply nothing more than observing in an un unhabitual way. Observing life without habit. All the bad mental entanglements, emotional prejudices we have. If you could see life in, with, the, with the clarity of a little child, then you wouldn't have any problems. And you don't. You see, your, through, you see through your prejudice eyes. You see through clouded vision. You see through a mist of excuses and hostilities and prejudices and misinformation, a sea of lies. Um, my son was saying, um, he went to the Price Club, you know where that is, and uh, he said to friends who he's with, well, I won't be long, 20 minutes. So he was about 30 minutes. And there was a young lady with him, accompanying him, and when he came back, he says to the friend who asked where, where he was, he says, oh, well, I couldn't get served. But they also walked around a little bit, you see. And the girl that was with my son, the young lady that was with my son, never said anything. She says, yes, we just, we couldn't get served. Now, they both lied, didn't they? A little bit. They lied just a little bit. And he observed himself that if you could be supported in 1% of, of all the lies that are in your li life, just that 1%, you're actually reinforcing 100%. Who understands what I just said? If you have anybody agree with you in the smallest, littlest thing, if you, could, if you can convince somebody that you're, a good, that you're generous or that you're thoughtful, if you can convince anybody of anything for whatever ego value it has, if they see you in a certain way which you've contrived to make them do, then everything about you, all the lies that you have about you is, everything you are is reinforced. And so is it the case with emotions. One, every little emotion you feel, no matter how small, if you trip over the cat, that reinforce, that emotion, that little resentment, reinforces every little thing about you, all of your bad habits, all of your notions, all of your Christian Buddhist, whatever it is you're teaching, everything in that moment is energized. And you, not only is it reinforced, so you walk around the same person, but you're worse. I mean, out of the top of that pops an, another little syndrome, another little habit pattern. Because you, it takes energy to make you move and have your being and to develop this inner person. And either the inner person develops from an outer means, a relationship with the environment, stresses, pressures, excitements, stimulations, challenges, etc., etc., or it is uniquely formed from a, a mysterious process which very few people find, for which reason we're all in conflict with it, which, which we, that which we haven't found. It's there, you see, but we haven't grown from it, so the inner man never grows, the inner woman never grows. It, this other one grows. The one gr that grows is the one that grew from some distant trauma. Someone laid a trip on you. You saw your mother in bed with a boyfriend or something like that, and that shock started, seeded who you are, and from that point onwards, you have never drawn a sane breath. And you've lost your genius. The shock traumatized you and set up the system of continuously reacting to stress and environment in order to exist as that person because the other person is no longer. The other person exists only as a guilt. The, the, the person that might have been. And every time you react, you keep growing. That, it's, like a, it, it's like a seed, an oak tree is a seed. One wants a seed, but if you keep nurturing it with water and sunlight and the proper fertilizers and conditions, it will all of a sudden lose, the seed disappears, and all it takes the form of a tree, and it keeps growing and growing and growing, and with more and more sunlight and more and more nutrients, it keeps on popping out here and there, right? And so do you. Okay? Now, 
What we need to do is to understand these processes, and in our continuing series of the Battle of the Mind, I hope, I mean, some of you, are you flashing on things right now? How many people are flashing on things? Wow! So we got the first flasher over there. Please don't flash too much at once. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have a syndrome and I'll be... It must be flashing because my heart's beating very fast. Okay. Um, I'm very frightened. Um, are you saying, I had a trauma in my life. Uh, first of all, I'm a cigarette smoker. You am or you were? I am. Well, we'll fix you tonight. Maybe that's why I'm standing up. I don't okay. know. Okay. Um, <coughs> I didn't start smoking until I was 29 years old. And I started smoking at a time when I had a trauma. That was when my ex-husband and I divorced. He left me. And I just want to clarify something that I'm not sure about in something you said previous to this is, are you saying that I like nice, precise questions. It, it shows me that you're following and that you want a, a real answer. You understand? Yes. Some people don't give precise questions, and I have to sort of invent their uh, question, not to give an answer. Please, thank you. Okay. Uh, if, if there was something in my life that I hated, that I fell to before, and then I experienced this trauma of my ex-husband and I splitting up, him leaving, Yes. is that how the cigarette smoking got... I started smoking the cigarettes. I, uh, I, you, you said something about a prior life to your husband. I don't see where that f f fit into the question. Okay, uh, I realize I'm, I'm trying to be can you be, more, can you be more, in other words, are you saying that the onset of cigarette smoking, was that due to the stress of my husband leaving me? Or something prior I to know that? I know that. I, I, I believe sure that? I am, but I don't know why, why it was a cigarette smoking? Why didn't I start drinking? Why well, didn't I you, go to, you know, dope? <laughs> you know, why yes, was well, you may, you may, may have, you could have very well started drinking. It wouldn't make much difference because, but you may have had a, a, an abhorrence to drinking. Maybe, let's say you had a father that drank and you hated anything to do with drinking or detested it and it revolted you. Um, you may not be a drinker, although you could hate him so much you could end up becoming just like him. You, you understand that. Mm -hmm. You could be molded. You, the identity inside you could grow from that so much. And the more you try not to be like him, the more you like him. Mm -hmm. It happens. It happens. It, you may succeed for a while and eventually give into it and succumb to the very thing that sprung up in you because you've hated it, see? Neither, but, one, of my, neither one of my parents smoked, though. Although I did find out later in life, but it was after I started smoking, that my mother was secretly smoking. Ah. But my, I didn't find that out till after I had already smoked. Yes, well, that could have a lot to do with it. But the, the, the basic question is, um, you could have been, I mean, you could have picked up any number of habits, um, but, you, but you chose smoking for whatever reason. It doesn't make much difference. Whatever is available and what is socially acceptable. If you're a rebel, you will choose something that's not socially acceptable. And that's a part of your rebellion, right? It def I think it was a rebellious thing I did. Even but, but, but smoking is a rebellion in itself, though. It's an attempt to rebel. It's to fight off the conscience. It's, it's a reinforcement to aid you in not knowing, um, forget it, forgetting your inability to deal with life properly. In other words, it's a way of not knowing. It's a way of, of rejecting reality. In other words, ego-wise, it's rebellion against knowing. Because whenever we have overreacted to environment with anger and hate, it, you can't help but be a real small, small part of the real us gets displaced. And something the thing we hate gets inside us. And we actually become what we hate. And we don't like what's growing up in us, and we don't like to see it. But we don't know how to stop it. So what do we do? The next best thing is not to see that it's happening. And that's what smoking is, a rebellion against seeing what is happening. It's pride's way of dealing with the problem of looking at ourselves. If it isn't there, then you don't have to feel guilty. See? Or you, you, when you smoke, you actually uh, anesthetize your conscience. And somehow, when that happens, what you're looking at 
doesn't seem to show up in such stark contrast as to bother you. It, you can sort of live with it. Don't notice it because there's no contrasting value there. I remember, I must, I don't know what it was, but I really had, I really forced myself to smoke. I remember when... Well, that's silly. I, I know, it was back then. And, and now I'm going through a, a battle up with my mind to stop and it's, it's like I'm struggling with it. Yes. And I be, it's like I believe you, I see the truth in your principles you speak, and you say don't smoke, and I wonder why, well, why don't I not smoke? Well, you know? You see, the trouble is, is that you need the you that isn't you anymore, needs not to see. Because the you that isn't you anymore, if it could see, wouldn't be, wouldn't be that you anymore. It's a, see, what is very hard for many people to realize that this imprinting, the self which I call, it comes from imprinting from trauma. It's a self that actually grows up inside us like an alien. Just like an alien in the movie, The Alien. And, it, and it, it, it's, it's nurtured by the more of the same emotions and experiences that, that created it. So in order, you, you, once you start to hate, let's say you hate your husband, once you start to hate him, a thing starts grow up in, growing up inside you that needs to hate. You'll think of him, you'll see husband, somebody, a husband and wife just like, who looks like your husband, and you, you resent them for being happy and you're not. You see, you resent, you see, you resent your children because it reminds you, your, your son reminds you of your husband. You mentioned, Roy, about um, how... Well, can I just, can I just finish? Mm -hmm. Can I just finish? I just want to make a point that this alien self needs the cover of drinking and smoking, and it is in control of your thinking. You are not. It will give you the excuse. It will give you the compulsion. It will obsess you with something, to look for something to, with, with, to distract, because it cannot tolerate the tormenting light of conscience. It now must survive. It's a survival mechanism of the it that is not you, but the it that you think is you. See? So therefore, it becomes a psychology of thinking. It gets inside, and it starts to control you and to think through you, as if it were you. And because you think it is your thoughts, you follow it. Have you noticed that you cannot change your thoughts? You cannot change a habitual thought, an obsessive idea that keeps coming back and back and back. As, and then you struggle with it, you struggle with it, you struggle with it, and then finally you, you seem to give it more f power, don't you? And then you think to yourself, it thinks through you, and you think to yourself, and you think it's you thinking? Well, you know, it must be natural. <laughs> Is that right? Why fight nature, right? And then you give in to nature. You buy that one, and you give in to it, and what have you got? More obsessive thoughts and conscience. And then the, the, the thoughts come back to you stronger than ever, sometimes laughing at you. And you, 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 you experiment with them. Instead of standing back and learning how to deal with them, you don't know how to do that. It makes you afraid to stand back and look because it produces pain. And the pain that, that you feel is what it feels. But you feel like it's pain, and you feel like you're dying. It's it's dying, but you think you're dying. And it feels bored because it doesn't have the energy. It hasn't got that connection. It wants you to have a habit. It wants you to go back to lower and lower relationships. Inter it wants to, you to interact with the environment because that's how it got in. And it, that's how it sustained. It got in through a reaction, a no-no reaction, an initial trauma. And it keeps growing through, well, how can I say this? You could notice that the first time you smoke a cigarette, it tastes horrible. Perhaps you, you may have to cough and splutter and try to get an acquired taste. But once you start to get the value from it, which is the escape value, and, and once the it in you begins to get it slip in under the cover of that night, huh? then strangely enough, the very thing that was abhorrent to you before now becomes attractive. In other words, you start to live in a reverse back-to-front nightmare. See? Where that's what the wicked people of the world want you to do. They want you to experience sexual promiscuity. They want to violate you. 
They make all the wrong things, the non-spiritual things, the improper, the sins, attractive. And they give you the proper reasons, the appropriate reasoning, which it becomes your reasoning because you don't have anyone to countermand, to override that with enlightened reason because there are ha hardly any enlightened people in the society anymore. And, and they want you to violate you with this improper degrading act. Now, if you, it, as an innocent person, you see there's something wrong with that. In this way of, as William James says, you could see things with a genius of uncluttered prejudice, right? Without the clutter of prejudice. In the unhabitual way, right? You see that. But the world keeps crowding in and saying something wrong with you. Why don't you come in? It's fun. There's something wrong with you for seeing something wrong with us. And you see everybody's caught up with that. So now you, you do this degrading act. And lo and behold, you are no longer, you are transformed. You are no longer the same person. And even though you feel guilt about it, which is the, the nagging of your trailing conscience, the other thinking gets inside and talks to you and always talks you out of doing the right, it makes you doubt that what, what you know about yourself is true. And it makes the forbidden thing even more attractive because only that way can you can find any relief by losing yourself in, the, in that same process by more sex and more smoking and more drinking. Can you stay ahead of your conscience at the same time feel like you're coming alive and living it up and becoming more of a person when you're becoming more of a jerk? Yes, no. Oh, Am I making a point? Yes. Okay. Um, I've been meditating. I'm a beginning meditator and um, I find that a lot of, as I meditate more, a lot of thoughts come into my mind about, it just like a whirlpool of thoughts just get into me and I find myself remembering things about my past um, that kind of, I have Reviewing, a tendency yeah, to, it's a review. Yeah, and I, so I ten, had a tendency to cry out of my, <laughs> it's weird, but my left eye, it, 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 almost unconsciously it just happens where I start to tear or I don't know whether it's a sign of emotion or... Well, no, no, with no emotion present, I take it. There was no emotion at that I time? I was still, but yet the tear just... The tear that I just could not um, stop just start coming out. You know what that's called? Repentance. It's, 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 a, it's a sadness of the soul that has no emotion with it at all. When that process begins, the minute you start to cry, a, a, an unemotional tear, not emotional, Watch out for the emotion, because that's a false sorry. That's the act for sympathy. Who understands what I'm saying? It's a baby cries to be, get its own way and to get sympathy. You know, give, give me love and I'll stop crying. Roy? Yeah? Um, when, when your soul becomes anesthetized by eating or smoking to try to escape, it's like... I have an eating problem. I'm really like a skinny person. Everybody has an eating problem. There's no such thing as a person without one. Well, I never do that, like some people. You know why that is? You have to eat, you have to eat my book, I almost said. <laughs> 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 eat my book, Eat No Evil, and it tells you about it in there. It's an excellent book. You've got to be ready for it, though. You've got to be a, a stout-hearted soul. Okay, go it ahead. It seems as if, like, I notice meditating, I've learned to be more aware. One of the things I've noticed that when I eat, it's usually either it's excitement, egotistical, overwhelming excitement about an event that's really not so significant, but yet I, it heightens me, you know. Or it's something that if I'm worried or stressed about my expenses or my financial situation or something or something I did, I'll just eat. And I know, at that moment, I know that it's, it's um, a way of escaping. I see myself, but yet like you said, it's like a strong pull into it, and I'll just keep but eating. But you eat sometimes, you eat to reinforce the nature. For instance, you're going to, you're going to, I, I was having a, a, um, a battle with a homosexual on, on a radio program, and I was really getting to him. And at each station break, of course, it was happened to be in a hotel lobby, and there was a, a little restaurant next door, and he, every time, every station break, he'd, rush over there and get some Twinkies or some, you know, pudding and pies and stuff himself in because that's how he gets mother's love, that's how he gets reinforcement 
That's how he gets, a, uh, how he, it helps him to deny the truth. And it reinforces his, his fallen identity's argument, strength against me, you see. See, so that's what we use food for. We use alcohol for courage. We use food for courage. A false courage energizes the, 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 uh, the um, degraded person. We're all degraded people. Um, there's very little human dignity. Very little human dignity at all. Why? Because we don't even know what it is. Yes. Um, one more thing. After, when we find ourselves in these habits, and because we meditate, that is the way to hopefully eventually become released from these things that bind us. It's like also another problem I have is that in the past... Don't throw too many at me at one time, because we've got to explore one at the time, you know. Yeah. One more. One more. No, one no, more. just... Well, um... All right, all right. You, you pressured me into it. <laughs> Well, I, I, hold on, just a second, before you get to that, because uh, th I wanted, wanted to say one thing about what we were talking about. The, the, on the emotion issue, um, in terms of repentance, it seemed to me, what, what I thought of when you said that was the part in the, in the New Testament uh, when Jesus is talking about praying in your room alone. And he said, don't pray in front of other people. Right. Uh, I think he says something about the fact if you do that, you have your reward. Mm -hmm. The thing, it seems, what struck me is that if you are in the process of realizing something about yourself and you get caught up in this wonderful emotion that just overtakes you, you're getting your reward. And, and it seems to me that, that in a way all of what we've been talking about... It's a sham on your own stage. Yes. See, it's a, it's a sham on your own stage. You feel sorry for yourself. Yes. And th that was is, that, is that the point you're making? Yes. And you've got to be very careful because that could be a drug. The, oh, your own emotions that you can invent can, can, pardon? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll have to, one second because. Oh, oh one more last thing. Um, I, in the past, I had made the mistake of making someone a god, a, a man, and. Everybody's made that mistake. Well, I have to suffer. I feel like it hurts. I'm suffering for it. You take I your identity, it. you take your identity from the process of making somebody a god. The Greeks used to do that with their statues. They were imperfect people, but they were able to make beautiful statues, and they would make these beautiful works of their own hands and bow down and worship it, hoping, of course, uh, imitating a process that we do with one, with one another rather uns unsuccessfully, because mostly we, we imbibe the worst of other people, not the best. How long does one <laughs> have to suffer? Like, well, how long do until you, you suffer? Until you, the suffering wakes you up. Yeah. Suffering is a very good thing. You don't want to take suffering away from people because it's the only thing if they haven't got wisdom that will make them look for it right okay thank you very much and uh, well we got five just four four minutes um, these half an hour set go ahead um go ahead well, actually since we have a little time I was going to add one other thought connecting to the smoking and to the emotion and and that is something that that I've heard you talk about in terms of uh, dying to the world and it seems to me that that uh, that smoking or or anything like that, eating ice cream or anything you can name, is a process of living to the world and and uh, maintaining the world. Maintaining part. the world, and once yeah. we identify with that maintenance, there's this terrible feeling. It seems to me that if we let that go, gonna... there'll be nothing. There's this great black void that we're going to fall into. Listen, and that will never survive if we give up uh, our ice cream or whatever it is. You want to sit here or something? <laughs> <laughs> Clip him out. <laughs> On the editing floor with him. I love it, I love it. You see, I have a problem is that I won't say I was perfect or always innocent all my life, but I really haven't suffered. And the only way I know what I do is slyly picking it out of your brains as I can talk you out of your, pull you out of your hole and you, you can confess. I get you to confess all these little things. So I've got, uh, you know, about 45 years of memories, but it's so much better if we have somebody who is stuck in that hole and experience. I really haven't, I haven't experienced and suffered like most of you have. So he's talking from first experience and you notice I'm talking from some other space and when, he's, when he or somebody else, even my son, starts to talk, they're talking from real gut-level experiences, and you can identify better with them than you can with me. That's why I hope to get most of you to talk, because you, you embody 
what I am talking about, and it comes out street language, see? Streetwise. And I didn't mean to ignore you, but we're coming to the end of a segment. Um, Bill, could you help me make a commercial? No. Could you help me make a commercial? Yes, how about it? Because I, I know because, you know, I don't know what I'm saying. It, it sort of blends in with the rest of the program and people don't hear it. I think, I think you have the way to say it. I think it's important for people just to know about the meditation, but I think you're the one to tell them. So, Well, I just, uh, this marvelous way of seeing life through the eyes of a innocence, where you have this genius that I started out talking about today is available to you. And I have, well, I don't know if it discovered me. I guess we met halfway. I was searching and, and I, f I, I found. Or it was seeking a man who was receptive and I was it, I suppose. But whatever it is, I found a way to help you to see through unprejudiced eyes. So you can see things the way they are without overreacting to what you see, which is a big problem. See, sometimes you overreact not to see. Once you, anyway, I haven't got time to go into the details. Tomorrow night we'll continue with this trend of thinking, and please um, write to the foundation and ask for the materials. The uh, information will be on the screen. Thank you very much, and join you tomorrow night. Part two is next. Hello, I'm Roy Masters, and we're talking about the mind and uh, the battle for the mind your own mind. Most people think that they have their own mind and they think through their own mind and they make up their own mind and they decide with their mind and it isn't true. The truth of the matter is that we are zombies and of course our pride doesn't like to think that we are anything but, you know, who we are. I was watching a program the other night. It was about death and dying. I just saw a little bit but I heard enough to make me uh, stop, make me think, because they were talking about this woman who, who had this choice about how she should die or whether she'd go on living, and they said, well, it's Josephine's, it's her life. See, and it isn't Josephine's life at all. It isn't our life at all. We don't have, our own, we don't have a life of our own. There's no such thing. Um, it just doesn't exist. It's a very hard concept to grasp that we're not free moral agents. We may be free immoral agents. <laughs> We're not free moral agents. There's no such thing as freedom. We, the choice is, the choice is if there's such a choice left. And my, my concept is that we are, should be saved from that original choice, which we all, all share. The Adam and Eve syndrome coming, sharing a common heritage of being mindless. See, thinking that we are having our own minds, which is a lie. See? So there's only a choice between, you know, being free from the, being free to do what's right and to live that life from the inner inbreathes, from the inner inbreathing of our soul, or to imbibe ourselves to, to get down into the world and grab all the custo you can for this substitute person, which is a creature of culture. And a creature of culture, which is uh, uh, antithetical to that which we were created to be. Culture grabs us, puts its mark in us, puts its imprint, and our love of the world is really this thing's love for what created it or recreated it. Yes? Well, I guess that's where we start to get in trouble is when we uh, get ambitious and start to decide what we want to do with our life and not think of any higher purpose or what God wants to do with our life. Yes, well, that's exactly right. It's, it's called selfishness. And it's the selfish side of us that's really wicked. Because if the selfish side of us that thinks, the part of us that often thinks it's our life to live and do as we want, if it should see the truth for one minute, it could not be selfish. It would have to be selfless. I think that's why most see? people, most of the time, they have to be caught up with something. You know, you see fat people, caught up, you see... Caught up and caught away from seeing the truth about themselves. People are always caught up away from seeing the truth. They're caught up with something that gives them the illusion that they are, their given nature craves. It craves an identity, an idea, a reinforcement of the lie identity that has made a home in it. Does anybody track what, what I'm saying? In other words, we're really not ourselves, but we think the self is who we are. So if you're born in Borneo, you'd be a good cannibal. 
And if you're born in, in Iran, you'll be a good Ayatollah, Ayatollah fellow, whatever you are. And uh, an Ayatollah nail or whatever you are. <laughs> He'd be so ingrown, I suppose. <laughs> Ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> but it worked a little bit. <laughs> and you see, it doesn't make a difference if you're born in a Jewish family. The Jewishness will grab you. If you're born in a Christian family, the Christianness will get you. And then you'll have to go to church, and you'll feel like you're guilty if you don't go to church. And if you're born in an alcoholic environment, well, maybe you'll feel guilty for not going to the local pub. See, because if, you, if you've got to get your reinforcement, you've got to be caught up with something. Is there a way not to be culturized like that? Yes. <laughs> you see, I think, I've always said that civilization, as we, what we call civilization, is really culture. That culture rises as the man, the but civilized man. But is there a way man. to do that not to your children? Oh, yes. Yes, because, but only, the only way you can not do it to your children or pass it along, because you must pass it along, you understand. You are under a compulsion to pass. Who can see why, why it's, why we have to pass it along. What is the mechanism of passing along? Why do we are under a compulsion to pass it along and to impregnate our children with the same vile identity that we have? It's hard to justify ourselves. Okay, one. Go ahead. Stroke our egos. Stroke your ego. Well, <laughs> justify, stroke ego. What else? To perpetuate. No, because we, because the thing which has grown up in us is intolerant of the light that is still in their child. We must put it out to survive. We react to the outside uh, uh, to the same way as we react. If, it's out, if the truth is in two places, it's inside us and outside us, inside people. And where it's still intact in other people, it makes us face ourselves and creates pain. So we impulsively move to destroy the pain and we will destroy our own children's perception by screaming and yelling and upsetting them and projecting us into them and putting their light out, okay? But how do you realize what culture you're in if it's not a physical culture? All cultures are sick. Just remember, there's no such thing as a healthy culture. There are some better than others. I'd rather be in America or in a Jewish home or a Christian home than in, in uh, being born a cannibal. I mean, some, of my, some cultures have it within their parameters to hopefully, it was the original intent of the founders, to make a, a penitentiary a, a surround you with rules because if you weren't surrounded by the rules, you'd become more cannibalistic and more, you'd go more native, go more wild. So they hem you in with rules, at the, the uh, tables, or the laws and commandments written on stone and parchment. It says no further. See, thou shalt do this, and thou shalt do that, and thou shalt not do this, in the hope that by constantly reminding you that what you finally awaken to their meaning, and when you finally awaken to their meaning, you no longer need the stones to remind you. Follow that? You will have become restored to the laws within. See, so, so those are the best of cultures, the Judeo-Christian ethic, and you see what happens when you tear down the Judeo-Christian ethic? That which, as a stern schoolmaster or mistress, surrounds you with herself or himself, <coughs> to say, no further, kids. See, now the, you are a spiritual criminal, and you need this wall around you. Otherwise, you'll become like the other nations. You'll become cannibals and degenerates. If you look at the various cultures of the world, you're not looking at at, um, an if, if you go to Australia and you see the Aborigines and you see them in their ob Aboriginal state, we, call it, we look at them as creatures who have not yet fully developed. If you take an Aboriginal child, put it in America in a, in a, in a decent home, where he grew up to be a doctor or a lawyer, guarantee you, has nothing to do with, his, with being some kind of um, Neanderthal, um, creature that has not as developed as far as we Westerners. It is the culture that stifles mm -hmm. and implants and degrades. It is culture that does it. Even the so-called, you know, noble cultures like Judaism and Christianity, that is, even that can pr implant an artificial stifling substitute for what is real. You call them 
you make a hypocrite individual rather than a real person, see? That you're, you're, you're surrounded with so many stumbling blocks that keep you from growing as a child of the light, you see? The gentleman has been standing up for a while. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob, Roy. I'm, you brought up alcoholism. I'm an adult child of alcoholics. I've been in the program for eight months. I've listened to you for the past month, and I found that a lot of your principles coincide with the principles of AA. Sure they the do. The 12 steps. The trouble is that it becomes a culture within a culture, right. and you become addicted to whatever supports you get to keep you from getting drunk, and, and therefore you never, you never outgrow them. <coughs> and they become addicted to the power of it, and they see to it that you never outgrow them. And then the whole purpose of it is, dis is destroyed. Is that right? Yes, that's what I found. And after listening to you, and I, I, I got your tapes the other day. I thank you for that. You told me to forget my pride, and I ran over here and got the tapes. And I started meditating, and I did find that spot that release? Did in you myself. Find yes, that, that connection with my God, my higher power and? for the first time. And what happened? I've been a resentful, angry man all my life. And why were you angry? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, well, you, you were the reason. I mean, this, Any, this anything you want to give the whole me, world's crazy. Your parents are crazy. Sure. They were terribly crazy. See, my mother was crazy. My it, father was it, a wimp. You're born into an insane world, and, and it tries to make you think you're crazy. Yeah. And it tries to drive you crazy. And to some degree, it succeeded only because it succeeded in tempting you to hate, to getting you to react. Because once they can get you to react, whether pleasure or pain, pleasure or pain, it doesn't make you, they can seduce you <coughs> with music, with excitement, with sex, all the forbiddens, appeal to ego. But if they can establish an emotional connection to your mind, you become one of them. And you don't know how to stop being one of them. And then you hate to see that you're one of them and you start to drink like them because the same is in you that was in them that hates to see the truth about itself. But something has, has pulled me all my life. I resisted the Catholic Church. I resisted alcoholism. I resisted drugs. I got into them. But something brought so me out. Just so long you can resist it. Hmm? It's just so long you can resist it but if you have resentment. I'm 41 years old. I'm doing better than I've ever done in my Good. life. Yeah. I'm, I'm making contact with you, your principles, your form of meditation, and what attracted me to your ideology or whatever you would call what you do. Uh, is giving me the power, not that I have to rely upon you, That's like it. AA. I love that. That's the thing that I appreciate about your program. It's going to give it to me, and I feel like I have that. You do. You know what? It, it takes one to know one. Now, I don't have any credentials. I don't want any. My credentials you see shining in me. That's it. No more than that. And it's that in me that is possible, if it's in me, to awaken you to it. And sometimes just seeing, experiencing another human being who knows the light, who's sure of that light and has never doubted it, mm. see, and confirms the fact that you have, that's your problem, come back to it. That moment is more than all the psychology, all the religion. It brings you back to a nature, see. Now, have you ever, uh, in the Bible, it's the, 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 uh, the, the scribe, not the scribes, but the... Um, Disciples will go around saying, in the name of Jesus, do this. Really, to, to be more accurately, what they were really saying in a sense, in the nature of Jesus, by his nature, by his authority, not by only his name. See, can you imagine, can you imagine, uh, uh, just to, make, to illustrate it, can you imagine someone coming to your door at night, a policeman wants to get in, he has a warrant to search your place. And he'll say, open up in the name of the law. And you'll look outside, you'll see if he's dressed in the right uniform. See if he has a badge, right? In the name of the law, right? But he has to be dressed in the right uniform. And of course, he could be a crook, but the point is, it, he's not gonna, he's gonna hold up a badge and you may let him in, right? Okay, well, can you ha imagine him holding up a stick of salami and saying, in the name of salami, let me in? <laughs> so you can't see that, see? In other words, he has to everything. He has to have the uniform, he has to have the badge, and he has the right name. It's the same thing. I want, I want to get into you somehow. I want, I want to reach you in some way. And unless I have 
all of the trappings, but especially the nature. <coughs> See, because I want your nature to recognize my nature. And, and, and that is the catalyst. Because it, it minute you recognize it and acknowledge it and you're glad to see it, something is established in you that starts to grow. It's antithetical to when you saw the nature of your parents, the dark side, and you, you saw and it made you doubt. It separated you from your bright side. It made you doubt and, and, and it upset you and it got into you. And that's, that's all you've ever known. And it in you made your conscience your enemy. So that you began to have the same habits as the world, but even though you weren't as the world, not, not quite, something in you is still is different. You know what I'm saying? But also, I don't want to give up sex. And I never I, said you should. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm having a problem with that, like with the alcohol. I, I don't really indulge in alcohol that much, but there are times I'd like to have it's a It's okay, have a glass of wine with your dinner. That way you know that you, 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 are practic you have the moderating spirit. A person who does not have the moderating spirit cannot do anything with propriety. If he eats, he's going to eat too much. If he drinks, he's going to be drink too much. If he have sex, he's going to get into it until he can't get out of it anymore. Is that right? And, and, he, and the more he does it, the more he wants it. And the more he wants it, the more guilty he is. The more guilty he is, the more he needs sex not to feel guilty. But some which of is us, the very thing it, that makes him guilty. All it takes is once to have sex and we're hooked. You know? Yes. Uh, right, you are. See, he was, you're talking about schools and about the drug problems, and he said, if you were to take, if someone were to put something in your drink without realizing it, right. that it really, really wouldn't affect you or it wouldn't affect somebody who has a conscience or a control over themselves in a disciplinary way. Okay. But where with somebody else who's weaker, that, that substance fills all the void loopholes in there. It's an offering. If yeah. somebody puts something in your drink and that produces a certain effect, like a, a, a feeling of euphoria, uh, the weak person would immediately seize upon that to draw some value from it that should not be there. Right, because they have those, they have like loopholes I look at. I mean, the water coming over and filling up all the loopholes in there. It's not quite like that. Like it, that. Well, it is well documented that some people uh, uh, get into drugs for a while, but they never get addicted. They cannot be addicted because they are more, more of where I'm coming from. See, they are more. They try it, and yet somehow it doesn't do anything because there's got to be something in your soul that is set up to become compati compatible with it. Uh, by, by hook or by crook, by design or, you know, did you, you going to say something? I was just going to say, uh, my mother is a very uh, uh, energetic person, always very social. Uh, you know, member of the junior league and this and that, and she's very positive. Loves, likes to party and that kind of atmosphere thing. I'm not, and in, in saying this, I'm not trying to challenge you. You know, I've followed you for two months now, and I think what you say is great. But some things puzzle me. All right. One of which is... I just love challenges. Well, one of which is, uh, you know, that, that joyful... I, I wonder if sometimes you're denouncing the joyful spirit to enjoy life, to go out and have a good time, because that's what I like to do. Yeah, you know. what I was saying, too. <laughs> I, I still want to enjoy those things, and with that same kind of rush and excitement that I had. I, I no, hear don't. you talking about emotions. No, don't, no, Whether no, it be, don't, don't. you know, the, the sex, you know, the denouncing the sex, the drinking. I'm not denouncing, I'm not denouncing any of it. I, I guess I, that's what I'm asking. Did you hear me say a person who is moderate, uh, who is together, is temperate. He always knows when it's enough. He cannot go the extra mile or whatever it is. Okay. See, he can't do that. He, in other words, you take a lot of people going to a party and they get such a rush, such an ex they become addicted to partying. See? And you become addicted to drinking in the party. And then that awakens all kinds of sexual desires, and pretty soon you've got promiscuous sexuality and, and, and all kinds of problems mixing with the wrong people because you've lost your discretion. You've lost, your, you lost a modifying spirit. Yeah. See? This is, uh, I don't know, almost embarrassing. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. This is almost embarrassing. <laughs> I'd go to, uh, I'd, I was getting so, as I said earlier, uh, looking ex forward to 
racing home to see your show and you know I was starting to inside and, and as you say as opposed to the outward world interacting with the outward world my inner self was starting to grow that growth uh, you like good that? feeling yeah loved it you know as you say that moment that it's you a good realize not, it's the a truth. good not feeling it's a good not oh, it's feeling. fantastic but then you understand how I, said I was it? starting to go to work and uh, I'd just be sitting there you know interacting feeling good about everybody else you know and I wasn't getting anything done yeah, you know? <laughs> see well, you've got to be careful of what, not... What do you have to say? I'm talking... How, do, how can you use this to be productive? Do you, you know? know? Did you know? I mean, I'm not saying... I'm not saying I'm lazy or above or any of that. Well, I think, I think you're not dealing... You're not, <coughs> you're not handling this new knowledge properly yet. Because the, one of the big problems of, of experiencing Roy Masters is to become very hyper and ex flushed with excitement. Yeah. And wow, this is it, man. See? And to get all kinds of excitement and to want to reach into my books and cassettes. But you see, all you're doing is substituting one culture for another. I become your culture. And you'd become a little wind up robot. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and, you, and it will become so perfectly transferred to me that you will not have noticed the difference because your caught upness will preclude the ability to observe it. But are you denouncing? Do you know what I'm? Out? Did I say what I'm? Did I say it right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't want you. Listen, you know what I are love. Are you denouncing about going out and having a good time and no, just I'm not enjoying denouncing. life? If you would come to my house, I'm gonna. I swear, I'm gonna put one of those special microphones in my house, and when my kids come in, because they're all they're 35 to, to 23, and with all the kids, and just see. It looks like Popeye's Mansion. The walls keep, <laughs> you know, you know. It, there's so much fun, but nobody drinks and nobody smokes and no one listens to music. No one parties. They are. They have so much, so many jokes that Bob Hope, God bless him, could get a lot of new lines from that. I mean, they come out so spun. It's one barrel of laughs, my home. And. And it, when, when the kids come in, it is one big party. So I'm saying there is a way of being high, there is a way of being happy, but it is something not dependent upon the rush that you get from the world that you live in. See? It's an inner something, and it's a, it's a sweet and innocent joy, and you can never be intoxicated with it. You can never have too much with it. It's always the right amount because it's, it's the right relationship. You see? It cannot be, a, you cannot be overbalanced with it. It's always perfect. I like that. You like that? Yes. It's like I can, I can hear something being said, like, um, I just like to put it in another way. You're talking about how the spirit of moderation, that's like you remain accountable to your conscience. And you're saying when you take things to the excess, you're talking about like part of the excitement and like going beyond moderation, isn't it like you're looking for the value of being released from your conscience? That's, and that's all it is. is. Going beyond moderation it's, has always You're looking to for do. that release. It's like you want to lose it's your conscience. It is absolutely right. Going beyond moderation, I'm just, it's in his words, I'm playing it back, is always, always one has one motive behind it, is to be released from the inhibition of conscience. Not only to do what's wrong, because the wrong in you flourish, the error, excuse me, the error inside you grows from a, an, a, a, an emotional connection. You understand? The, the, the self within the self that's real is connected to the truth, a, whatever that means. A flow of life, an inbreathing from within you that very few people know. They only know it as conscience or conflict, being in conflict. So that part of us that's in conflict, in order to exist, has to in, be connected and constantly reconnected so its nature can be reinforced through a rush of excitement. So two things happen at one time. One, you get caught up with the excitement, conscience disappears. It release, immediate release, emotion. You get caught up, and you, but then you, some, you get caught into it, but what is you into gets into you, and you feel like you're more of a person. But you're more of a person for which reason you have conscience. Now, this is the nature of addiction, that in order to release the conflict between having become worse for rejecting reality, see how I said that? Let me say it again. You get caught up with a rush. The rush, you get caught up in that rush, 
and you get caught away from the reality which is conscience, that's release. Release from guilt, release from boredom, release, release from think, discovering how wrong and dead you are. See, from seeing the mess that you've made of your life. All that reality is gone for a second. You get caught up into that and it comes into you and more of what you think of as you is there, but that's the sin self. That is more of a sin self that is now in greater conflict with conscience, which now needs greater amounts of rush. Drugs, sex, you have to have more, you have to get deeper into it to get away from reality in order to be. Otherwise you'll disintegrate. You, you cannot sit still in a room. What, what is there that's so contagious about a laugh or people at a party having a good time? It's, it's reinforcement. It's the dirty jokes, the, the sexual connotations, the presence of other people, degenerates just like yourself. It is such a jolly feat because everybody has to drink. They've got to get into that. See, they've got to... Well, hold a second. We've got to save this tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is really, you know, more of tonight for us, so we are... I hate lies. See? I, I don't know. This, uh, this is a program without any pictures. You know, Jim and Tammy talk. <laughs> and, we, you know, you can't join, you can't belong. We are a church. We depend upon donations. Nobody has their hat out when they come through the door. You know, it costs money to produce the show. And I just feel like making a presentation like this off the cuff, having fun together. See how we're laughing right now? You're talking about the, the, the good... If we sat, sat together long enough without the lights and the te television cameras glaring, we could have fun like a barrel of monkeys, and there wouldn't be any drink, there wouldn't be any drugs. It would just have fun being with one another and bringing each other to the best rather than... Is that right? That's what's in my home. See, pure happiness in not needing anything to make you happy. Freedom. Is that right? The meditation, please, write to us for it. It will teach you how to be... To, to find this life and energy from within yourself and be independent, independently happy. Not dependently happy. What kind of happiness is that? Tomorrow, thank you very much. Join us in the next program. Part three is next, following this brief message. The preceding lecture was produced by the Foundation of Human Understanding. For more information, write to the Foundation of Human Understanding at P.O. Box 1009, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97526, or call 1-800-877-3227. Thank you. The Foundation of Human Understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the Foundation of Human Understanding, here is Roy Masters. We're trying to understand our mind. As a matter of fact, if you try to understand it, you'll never understand it. There's got to be a, um, a way of looking at your thoughts without analyzing them. If you could do that, you'll understand yourself. Understanding is a great mystery, and to that end, this program is dedicated to bring you to understanding. To talk about things which run parallel to what you've been looking for, all of a sudden you pick up on something uh, in a, such a special way that you'll, be, you'll, you'll remember what you've forgotten. All knowledge, really, is something you already know. And it, you've just forgotten it especially the knowledge concerning ethics and morality and principles by which your inner person 
is guided and shaped. But a usurper has crept its way into our midst and tries to displace this wonderful, joyous journey of becoming who we were designed to be and takes great pleasure in tearing down this self and establishing another one with different sets of pleasures and joys and happiness is, 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 is. See? And I can just have fun with you sitting here. We could, without these lights, of course, and everything, it'd be a lot more fun. We can go on for hours and hours, as we do in Tall Timber Ranch in Oregon when I have my seminar, six hours a day. It is amazing how, how fun it is to be with strangers, people you never met before, and to sit, talk about their problems, laugh, joke, cry. And six hours goes by, and you don't even notice it. It just, we pointed out, here we've been sitting here for six hours talking about life and having fun. Nobody drank, nobody smoked. Nobody wanted to. It was so much joy in discovering one another. How much joy do I have when I can watch my three-year-old, two-year-old child, I can watch that little kid all day long, just watching. There's such joy in me. And the, the little, little, little child, little baby, also has joy in, me in, in being watched. There's communication. Me, the watcher, the child being watched, getting that kind of attention. It doesn't have to nag me for that attention. Because then if I give it attention by nagging, it's the attention she's got by contrivance, by manipulation. And it becomes the wrong kind of attention. And it feeds the wrong self, the manipulated self. See, now, we're talking about the mind, and we were talking in our last segment about happiness. And um, we're trying to define what it is, I think. That's what we were getting to, weren't we? What, what happiness is really is. Now, the last thing I said was, happiness is not needing anything to make you happy. But that's my job. I want you to be so free that you don't need anything to make you happy, that you are always happy, and that nothing can make you unhappy. Because it is the greatest delight of some people. Their greatest happiness is to make you unhappy to take your happiness away because they think they have happiness because they can't see the truth. The egotistical happiness is thumbing its nose at reality, see? So if it doesn't know it's unhappy, it's happy. It sort of gets away with something it shouldn't. And, but if you're happy and you know what happiness is and you're, because you're innocent and you have the innocent joys that is a peculiar to innocent people, nobody else understands it, see? And other people see that you see, and you see that they're not happy. They see that they're not happy, and it gives them great pain for you to see them as they are. And it reminds them of reality, which they don't want to face. They have not faced it as a means of being happy, drinking, smoking, partying, and all that thing. So they try to take your happiness away. They, they call you a party pooper or something weird, something wrong with you, man. You don't like dope, sex, music, pot. You know, you don't like to do what you're living for, they say. What's your life for? And my, I, I, don't, I don't see that's living. My view is completely opposite. And we, I can understand them, but they can't understand me. I have two points of view, they only have one. And they're threatened by my one. So they try to take my happiness away, because that's what makes them happy. Because as long as I'm looking at them as though they're crazy, as long as my reality shines so strong as undisturbed, it disturbs them. It makes them miserable. So they get relief by putting me out, putting my lights out. Now, some people will make you happy in the same party by making you happy. But what does that mean? It means to help you put your conscience out. Here, have a, have a joint. You know, have another drink. Do you good. Let's, to, let's drink to this person, or Marilyn Monroe, or uh, Tammy Baker. <laughs> See, I'll drink to that. See, they have a way of, you know, hyping, providing you with the electricity you need not to know that you're unhappy, which is, and they have a way of loving you, stimulating you, sustaining you, supporting you in those needs that all egos have, mutually share, which is happiness, which comes from not knowing they're unhappy. See? Now, I am a happy person. And it's, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm sure there are some things that could take my happiness away, you know. 